We live in the most politically polarized time since the Civil War. Americans have sorted into two mutually exclusive groups, Democrats and Republicans, or liberals and conservatives, and we agree on absolutely nothing. Without a common culture, the United States is rapidly descending into a war of all against all, and may God have mercy on our souls. Well, not exactly. Morris P. Fiorina, a political scientist at Stanford and the Hoover Institution, regrets to inform you that you are absolutely mistaken. In his latest book, Unstable Majorities, Fiorina mounts a convincing argument that Americans actually agree with each other on many, if not most, fundamental questions. The polarization we hear about all the time is, he says, largely restricted to political activists and media elites who mistake their own extreme views for the voice of the people. In reality, Fiorina says, voters are not more extreme or polarized than in the past. Rather, it's the political parties who have pushed out to the far right and far left, and they're nominating candidates who represent fewer and fewer Americans. Why that's happening, why it's troubling, and how it might be changed are the topics we'll be discussing today. Morris Fiorina, thanks for talking to Reason. I'm glad to be here. Let's start with the title of your book, Unstable Majorities. Uh, You note early on that the four consecutive elections between 2004 and 2010 produced four different patterns of political control of the federal government. So, you know, the White House, Congress, the Senate all flip around in different ways. Since 2000, we've had two people who lost the popular vote but won the presidency. These are extremely atypical events. What's going on here? Well, I think it's very interesting. We're in a historically unusual time. Generally speaking, there is a majority party in the United States. There is no majority party today. In every election, each of our three national offices, the presidency, the House, and the Senate, are basically up for grabs. Uh, It's only eight years ago that the Democrats had the House of Representatives. The Senate is always on a knife edge. And as you point out, we've had two very close presidential elections where the popular vote winner lost. And then, and you talk about how even in 2004, which it was funny when I was reading the book, I was like, oh, Bush won that easily. But actually, it was pretty close. Yes. And 2008 was not exactly a blowout either. Correct. Even though the party won everything, it didn't win everything by a lot. Mm-hmm. There has not been a presidential landslide in quite a long time. Whereas when you think back to the, the previous generation, we saw Eisenhower in 56, Lyndon Johnson in 64, Nixon in 72, Reagan in 1984. We haven't seen anything like that in a long time. Yeah, and for a long time there was, uh, I mean, Bill Clinton in 92 won with 43% 43%. of the vote, which is extremely low. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. So why is this happening? Our parties have traditionally been catch-all parties. In in majoritarian systems like ours, you typically have a two-party system where both parties are broad-based. We don't have that anymore. We have two parties now that look like the Social Democrats and Christian Democrats in Europe at the late 20th century when they were very, very dominant. And you have two parties in a big heterogeneous country where people have all kinds of points of views that don't necessarily hang together. And it's simply not enough to represent the diversity of this country. So two parties, uh, two parties is not enough to represent 330 million people. Exactly. And the the point is because they're so homogeneous, when one party wins, it attempts to impose an an agenda on their country, which is often uh, not the same issues that the country thinks are the most important issues facing the country, and also more extreme positions on the issues that it does take positions on. But in order to win, uh, the parties have to appeal to centrist or independents. And you write, or or you note that it's about 40% of the the country identify as independents. So in in an election season, the at least at the presidential uh, level, typically a Democrat or a Republican will kind of move to the center to win. But then once they're in power, they go to the edges. Yeah, it's getting harder and harder in today's wired world for a party to move to the center uh, because they have you on film and on mm-hmm. the air and everything. But uh, I think it's fair to say we have, if you take turnout into account, we now have a one third, one third, one third party system that the Democrats have a third, Republicans a third, and a third are in the middle. So you win the election by capturing the lion's share of the middle, but then if you impose an agenda that's your base's agenda, a lot of the people in the middle say, I didn't really vote for that, and they abandon you in the next election. You know, uh, I co-authored a book a couple of years ago called The Declaration of Independence, where my uh, colleague and I, Matt Welch, made the the bold uh, argument that independence mattered the most. One of the common criticisms that we met uh, was that, you know, there really are no true independents. And, you know, people are just kind of bullshitting when they say, I'm not a Republican or I'm not a Democrat to pollsters. 
Are there true independents and how do we know they're out there? Uh, yeah, there definitely are. I mean, it's clear that some are closet partisans. There have always been some people who just like to say I'm an independent. But the, uh, this idea that all independents are closet partisans or even the lion's share of them is greatly exaggerated. But if you look at how independents vote, they vary, vary more across time, for example. They switch their votes. Whenever a third party vote, uh, candidate appears, independents are much more, even independent leaners are much more likely to go for the third party. So it's, uh, it's it, the yeah, true proportion of true independence, I think, is unknown, but it is enough that it determines the elections uh, out yeah, there. Yeah, because if you're talking about, uh, you know, 46% versus 48% winning the presidency, you know, that means 3% of the vote is going to make, uh, make yes, or break somebody. Exactly. And how does that play out in, in one of the most interesting things, and we'll talk more about the 2016 election in a minute, but, um, you know, so many counties, it seemed, or, or districts that voted for Obama twice then voted for Donald Trump. Is that a sign of independence or is that a sign of kind of cloudy thinking on the part of the electorate? <laughs> Well, I think, uh, first of all, we'd have to look and see just how big the changes in the, the counties were. I Maybe mean, if they went from 51 to 49, it doesn't represent a huge change, which is what, one of the things that happened in the popular vote. But I think it reflects the instability that, in contrast to a lot of commentators who say, Americans are locked in these two camps. No, I don't think it does. The same kinds of people who voted for Obama in 2012 um, come back and say, I want to vote for Trump this time. Now, those are people who are not really moored to either of the two parties. Part of what uh, I found fascinating about unstable uh, majorities is uh, your kind of understated venom towards most party activists, most political activists, and especially political journalists such as myself for not knowing what the hell we're talking about. In 2004, this happened, and again in 2006, where you saw first Republicans uh, when Bush won uh, won re-election and did okay, and the, you know the, uh, the Republicans did okay, but you saw people talking about locking in the permanent ma Republican majority. A couple of years later, when that all ended, suddenly people were talking about, oh well, it's going to be the Democrats for the rest yeah. of our lifetime. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why are um, I, I guess I know why party activists? It's kind of wish fulfillment or projection. So they when they win any election, they say we're going to win them all. Why are journalists and even a lot of political scientists so short-sighted in, in the ways in which this stuff flips and flops and back and forth? Well, in defense of my political science colleagues, I don't think that many of us actually said these are, these are landslide or shattering realigning elections. I think journalists, they say, talk too often to the, um, to the activists. They talk to the people who won. And there's a kind of triumphalism on the part of either of the either of the winning parties, which then filters through the uh, the journalists. Let me just say something about filter bubbles, by the way. That yep. this is a, a big thing in the news that everybody worries about the average American being ensconced in a filter bubble. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, the average American doesn't follow news very much at all. That most of the research suggests that it's the elites who are in these filter bubbles. It's the elites who only talk. Uh, to each other and who have this it's simply jaundiced or not jaundiced, prejudiced or not, what am I, what am I uh, for here? A totally a biased ignorant view or delusional of the, view. Yes, view yeah. of the world. And, uh, you know, for example, I'll give a talk and I'll put some data up and say, here's the percentage of Republicans who believe in abortion or who believe in gun control. And I'll get emails back saying, I don't believe your data. I don't know any Republicans who believe that. And those are the people in the filter bubble. They yeah. don't talk to anybody. You have it. some, I mean, incredible stats. And one of them is that uh, you, in terms of uh, kind of diehard Democrats, they think 44% of Republicans make over $250,000 a year, which is hilarious. And then this is, I might even be better, Republicans think 38% of Democrats are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. Right. Yes. Where, you know, why is that happening now as opposed to... I mean, it, it seems so out of touch. Uh, what What is fueling that kind of completely ridiculous view of the other side? I think, uh, first of all, I should just say those statistics were produced by some of our graduate students who have access to a polling firm here, and we all were, were mind-boggling when yeah. we saw those figures. But I, I don't think we can say for sure, but a lot of it surely has got to be TV that uh, TV and the internet, everybody else, uh, the, the media in general practice what's called exemplification. They say, we want to have a Democrat. And then they start thinking, well, what, what's a Democrat? Well, it's a protester, a minority. Uh, you know, I, there are the people down here, town and country, who protest the 65-year-olds with long gray ponytails. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you want a Republican. Okay, you want to be somebody suit and tie. You want to be or maybe a, an evangelical or something. And so, and the fact that socially we're much more segregated than we used to be when I was growing up, that we do live in more homogeneous neighborhoods, et cetera. Although again, that's exaggerated. But I think people don't 
they simply don't get out and, and know the other side. And so you get this picture from the media, and the picture is simply not very accurate. It's exaggerated. And it's not just from the media, though. I'm, and I'm thinking about recent books like Our Kids by Robert Putnam, the Harvard sociologist, and the Charles Murray, the Murray book, Coming book, Apart. Coming Apart. Where yeah, they, yeah. they, you know, and these are two guys who disagree with each other, although they come to common uh, kind of analyses of what's wrong in America. And one is, you know, that, you know, everybody's living in a bubble. Um, and how do you know then that like regular Americans are not in an ideological bubble the way that you know the elites are saying they are? Oh, well, this is personal that I, I come from as we were talking, mm -hmm. Trope, Pennsylvania, which is the heart of Trump country. Mm -hmm. And I think my county voted something like 96%, or no, my county is 96% white. They voted more than two thirds for Trump. And I go back and I talk to relatives and cousins and so forth, and they aren't the kind of the stereotypes you would see about what those kind of people would look like uh, that you see in the media. And so, I mean, partly it's just personal that there aren't many people in either academia or, or certainly the people who appear on CNN um, who sort of actually have any experience of talking to America in the flyover country. What are the areas where there are large uh, you know, majorities uh, where people on, on culture war issues where Americans actually agree, but then the way that it gets filtered through the political process, people are like, no, this is, you know, absolutely we're at the barricade. Sure, the, the, um, the, the social issues are the best example that most Americans can basically take Roe as it is out there and say, I can live with that. Right. That they don't want to outlaw abortion, uh, they, they're a little uncomfortable with some of the third trimester, well, more than a little uncomfortable with mm -hmm. third trimester stuff, but basically they can say we can live within this middle ground. Mm -hmm. Same thing with gay rights. On the one hand, they don't want to see a baker forced to bake a cake for a wedding. On the other hand, they don't want to see, they want to see gays have equal, equal rights. Mm -hmm. So they basically can sort of be in a comfortable middle ground. Big majorities of guns are another thing. Mm -hmm. Most Americans can, even NRA members, can, can sort of support what are called common sense gun control. Uh, but um, the other, the, uh, in each case, these we have activist groups in each party's base: the pro-choice, pro-life, pro-gun, anti-gun, pro-gay uh, rights, anti-gay rights, which make it which espouse much more extreme positions than the population as a whole. And so this means I, it's always interesting with abortion because if you go back to the early '70s, um, it wasn't clear the party split on that. But there are now I don't think there are any. Republicans in Washington who are pro-choice, nor are there any Democrats who are pro-life, or, or maybe one or two. You know, how did that become acceptable? Because, I mean, th so the parties have sorted, and you have these incredible charts where it shows that, you know, compared to 50 or 60 years ago, there's no variety in the parties. There are, you know, re the Republican Party is a conservative party. The Democratic Party is a liberal party. Why did they sort that way? What, what changed that we wouldn't have catch-all parties? You know, that's a great question. We don't have a good answer. I, I tried to uh, address that in my middle book, uh, Disconnect, uh, published in 2011, I think. And in some cases, you can point out demographic changes that really explain it. For example, we have a great internal migration of African Americans from the South to the North, and that pushes the Northern Democrats in a more liberal uh, direction on social welfare and civil rights. That in turn alienates more of the South, and the Republicans sort of look at that and see an opportunity. And you can tell a demographic story in something like that. But on the other hand, if you were trying to guess before abortion's on the agenda, okay, abortion's gonna be a big item, which party's gonna be pro-life? Most people said, well, probably the Democrats. They're the Catholic Party, they're the Evangelical Baptist Party, uh, and yet it doesn't work out that way. And by the same token, environmentalism, that the, envir the Republicans have a long tradition of being the conservative party with Teddy Roosevelt, things like the Audubon Society, the Sierra Club, Republican, sort of upper middle class Republican organizations. Why do they sort out the other way? And the Democrats, meanwhile, are blue collar workers whose industries pollute. Right. So, uh, so I think we really don't have a good handle on how it has to do with the activist groups, the social groups, but I don't think we have a good handle at all on just how the sorting uh, occurred. And then the, the large question though is, or, or the large point is that once the parties have sorted, uh, there's really no way, I mean, if, if you wanna vote, if you wanna be a voting citizen, you really don't have somebody who is, and if you're a normal American, which means you're somewhere in that middle, you don't really have a party that represents you. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a good chart in the book on that. Yeah. yeah. So why why do people pick? You know, but people then end up vote, mostly voting. You know, I don't, you know, in the presidential election, what was it? Maybe three or four percent didn't vote for either Republican or Democrat. How do we choose 
to say I'm, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. And there's a long political science literature on this, both in Europe and here, that the wasted vote thesis, that you know there's really only two choices. And so you don't want to throw your vote away. And that's why the, the proportion voting for, who say they're going to vote for a third party always diminishes mm -hmm. as you get near the end. Uh, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's a, a funny situation. I mean, you've got to vote for a party that's wrong for you on one or more issues that I, I always say, we live in an area here where thousands, tens of thousands of young professionals uh, who are struggling to get by and mm -hmm. continually vote for people who are going to raise their taxes because the alternatives vote for, vote for a party that says we're going to bash gays, restrict abortion, and log the redwoods. You know, and so, so in that situation, they're going to vote for a party that really doesn't uh, represent their economic interests. What about the, you know, there is that idea that, you know, demography is destiny in politics and that younger Americans, millennials, or, you know, if you want to say people under 40 or whatever, uh, you know, are obviously going to vote Democratic from here to eternity because, uh, you know, because of gay rights, because of immigration, because of drug legalization, things like that. Is there a reason to believe, and certainly at least uh, going back to, uh, certainly to Obama, I mean, the Democrats have totally cleaned the clock of the Republicans when it comes to younger voters. Um, are the Republicans just out of touch with young people and will never win them back, or what, what happens with it? Yes, they're out of touch with young people. Uh, as far as never winning them back, uh, never say never. Yeah. That uh, in politics, uh, was it Harold McMillan who said, a week in politics is an eternity. And at one point you'd have said, well, you know, Catholics are gonna vote Democratic forever. And then as Catholic social position changed, uh, they started voting Republican much more and more. And I think the same thing is true of all the demographic things. At some point, you know, I've often said parties can be stupid, but they don't stay stupid forever. Mm -hmm. And at some point, there are there will be a new leadership cadres coming up in the Republican Party who will say, "We got to take stock of what this country looks like now. It doesn't look like uh, it looked like in the late '70s or '80s when all the social issues and the social groups." And, and those are kind of when the contemporary identities of, or, or the current identities of the Democratic and Republican parties were founded. Um, yes. And, and those coalitions don't really exist anymore. So That's right. we're left with this hangover of these the husks of old coalitions that don't really speak to anything here. That's, that's right, and it's, it's true, interestingly, around the world. I mean, some other countries are ahead of us. For example, the whole, basically, French party system just collapsed. The Social Democrats disappeared. The and a guy without a real party yes, became yes, president. Suddenly, yeah. and, and see, the, the problem in the United States is we don't have, our institutions keep a Macron from riding to the rescue uh, that would happen in France. But this is happening around the world, that these, these calcified old party systems that just don't fit today's issues and today's concerns are coming apart. What can we learn from previous periods? In the book, you talk about the period of no decision in the late 19th century where it, it you know, uh, party control went back and forth and back and forth. One time, you know, a Democrat would win the presidency, a Republican, Congress, vice versa. What, what ended that to, to lock in, you know, Republican dominance and then Democratic dominance, et cetera, for any period of time? What ended it in, was 1896 when a Republican won everything and they governed in a way the population found acceptable, and they kept on winning. They won for 14 consecutive years and, and stayed the majority party until the Depression. At that point, the Democrats came in and governed in a way the population found acceptable. Now, what we're, have, we're seeing today is nobody governs in a way that for two years that the population finds acceptable, and they whack you in the next election. And that seems to be, you know, that's on the table for later this year in the midterm yes, election. exactly. So, you know, the parties have sorted. And then at one point you talked about Donald Trump may be a disorder. What does that mean? And is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think it's a good thing. Anything that, that fractures the current party system is a good thing. And I've been saying this and hoping for it for more than a decade, but it just doesn't, hasn't happened. But the fact that you remember when Donald Trump comes in and starts emphasizing issues like being anti-trade, et cetera, or different foreign policy, a more uh, America first foreign policy, he's attacked by the conservative leaders. You say he's not a true conservative. And that, that is how they define the Republican Party as being this party of true conservatives. And I think what they found out to much of their dismay in many cases, was that a whole lot of Republican voters are not true conservatives, that they're not sorted in the same way that the elites are. And so they found his trade policies acceptable in some cases. They found his more isolationist foreign policies acceptable. And I think the same thing is, tr is true in the Democratic Party, but you need to sort of have, have a candidate who sort of is, is off the sort of main diagonals of the party so to show if, that. So if Trump is like that with 
the Republican Party, and, and I, I can see your point, and, and he's moderated, to a certain degree, has moderated his stance on immigration and whatnot. He seems a little less, you know, he's no longer talking about kicking out 11 million people and all of that kind of stuff, um, although he hasn't walked it all back. But on the Democratic side, the insurgent candidate who really gave Hillary Clinton fits was Bernie Sanders, who seemed to be a an exaggerated form of what a Fox, you know, of what Sean Hannity thinks all Democrats are. Mm -hmm. um, is there somebody who would be a disorder for the Democrats that's on the horizon? I guess off the top of my head, I don't see it. But on the other hand, if you'd asked me six months before Trump entered the race, mm -hmm. is there a Republican? I couldn't have picked one out either. Right. So maybe I, it'll be it, Oprah or maybe something. Maybe there could be someone who just comes in and sort of takes a different position on some of the identity issues, the social issues, and finds there's a real path, they're all lanes, so to speak, uh, there. After the election in 2016, and you have a good deal of fun with this, but uh, you know, observers, uh, many observers, mostly journalists, were saying things like, "American democracy is doomed." Uh, Trump's election was an American tragedy. Uh, you know, will we be able to stop the obvious rise of fascism? Why are those sentiments so ridiculous? <laughs> okay. Well, the first thing was they, they overlooked the fact that, according to all the poll data we have, Americans thought they had a historically bad choice. That, that people don't realize how poorly Hillary Clinton was regarded by a large part of the American electorate. And the Gallup figures and others show that Trump was the worst candidate, worst regarded candidate in modern history. Hillary was two. That Trump had the great and they were fortune. And the, they were the only two in, in one chart that you have who, who had disapproval ratings above 50%. Oh, they both set records. Yeah. That, uh, that Trump completely obliterated. So this is like that season when Sammy Sosa had 66 home runs, but Mark McGuire had like 72. This yeah, was just this like a legendary. A record setting season. Yeah, yeah exactly. And they were probably both, uh, now that I think about it, Hillary and Trump were both probably using steroids as well. Yeah, <laughs> could be. And, and people knew what they were getting in Trump. If you look at the poll data again, they uh, didn't think Trump was qualified. They didn't think Trump had the right temperament. But they voted for him anyway, in many cases. Yeah. In one part of the book, you talk about when there are these moments of instability, it, it often comes along with there are, there are larger factors going on, things like uh, globalization or, or, or transformation of the economy. How is that playing out here? And what are those main factors that would, you know, would give Americans who are generally, you know, I mean, we might not be that smart, but we're not that stupid either. What, what are those large events that are giving rise to saying, OK, we'll take a chance on Trump? Okay, well, I, I uh, mentioned these in conjunction with uh, the parallels with the late 19th century, when you have large-scale economic and social changes going on. And then it was the Industrial Revolution. Today, it's this transition to a communications or an informational economy. Then it was population movements from the farms to the cities. In recent years, it's been the Frost Belt to the Sun Belt. Both are years of mass immigration, uh, more globalization. It's an ongoing process, but it surges at various times. And when you have these kind of changes going on, uh, they create dislocations. There are new winners. There are also new losers. They strain the old coalitions that they don't. They previous allies are now uh, in tension or with each other. Uh, they create opportunities for new politicians, and basically, it just creates uncertainty, political uncertainty. You know, libertarians. Uh, re reason is a libertarian organization. Um, libertarians are sometimes described as socially liberal and fiscally conservative, which also seems to be. Kind of the way that you and and you know Gallup, uh, every survey kind of shows that that you know most people are you know somewhat moderate, some are centrist, and I realize describing libertarians as centrist might set some people's hair on fire, but you know we want people to be able to live the way they want, but we also and we want a government that is vaguely competent but is not doing everything. Is a libertarian sensibility something that describes this centrist American voter, this modal American voter? Or, you know, what, what is a term that would do that more okay, fully? Some of them. I mean, in contrast to political elites, where basically they are on a left-right scale, most public opinion analyses find two dimensions. They find this economic and this social dimension. And there are the liberals on both and the conservatives on both who are happy with the two parties. But then there are two off-diagonal groups. And one is libertarians, a soft libertarianism that favors sort of economic prudence and minimal government, but social liber liberalism. The other is what they call populists who are sort of the opposite. They, they favor the social welfare programs, the safety net, and also more conservative on the social issues. So they're, in a sense, two unaffiliated group. Well, they're affiliated, but loosely with the two parties. And I guess at this moment, though, either of those groups can really play a big role in, yes. in elections. And it's clear that populists took the, you know, I mean, they, they, they won the day in this most recent election. That's right. Mm -hmm. How but about, a lot depends on the candidates. 
and and uh, it happened. There was there was a vehicle, Trump, for the populist uh, movement to come to or impulse, call, call it that. Uh, I wonder. I've always wondered uh, what if Bill Weld had been the top of the t libertarian ticket. I mean, I was in Massachusetts when Weld was governor, and I have great admiration for him. And so, had Weld been on the debate, for example, had Weld been the nominee, you might have seen the expression of the libertarian impulse coming out simply because. But otherwise, they had no. There was no worth for them and, to go. And I guess Weld also uh, it, he represents that uh, you know a type of Republican who no longer exists, right? That northeastern Republican who's, who would be called a, a moderate, maybe a country club Republican, but yeah. that mm -hmm. person doesn't exist anymore. That Correct social type. Um, how much of what's going on in American politics is reflective of global trends? Uh, because you know we hear a lot, and you write about this in the book. You know that populism is on the march in England and in Europe, uh, and it's always you know the lights are always going out in Europe. In this case, should we be worried, or uh, maybe that's the wrong term? Is is European populism and American populism are they linked or are they independent phenomena? They're linked through their the common cause, which is the underlying social and economic changes buffeting the societies. I was at a conference in Rome a couple months ago where scholars from all over Europe. There and the, the commonalities were, were clear that all over Europe, masses are concerned about immigration. And the European elites have tried to keep the lid on this in the same way our elites tried to keep the lid on civil rights for a long time. And it's bursting out now because non traditional parties are, are taking up the mantle of those. Uh, what about the social welfare state? I mean, obviously, Europe has a more robust uh, kind of set of safety net or social security programs than we do. Um, you know, but this is all like, are, are we at the end of the, the age of Bismarck, of the idea of a, a social welfare state that is funded by having lots of younger people who are funneling, you know, relatively a lot of people funneling money to relatively few people. And obviously, de demographically now, every country in the industrial wa industrialized world, especially Japan, but also in Europe and in North America, we just can't support this. Um, and, you know, on some level, People understand that Social Security is already running an annual deficit, that Medicare is running out of money, et cetera. And uh, it, is the anxiety about that coming up in, either in the form of being anti-immigrant because they're seen as takers as, a, as opposed to people supporting the system, or we just realize that whatever we're doing here, it's, you know, it's, it's effectively over. It's just a question of when the clock stops. Well, I, I don't know which of the two to choose, but I can certainly tell you from talking to these other scholars that part of the, I mean, you have welfare states that are under pressure just from budgetary reasons, right. just the age of austerity. But clearly a lot of the anti-immigrant sentiment reflects the fact that immigrants are straining, additionally straining mm -hmm. the social welfare system. Particularly if, if Muslim women don't work, for example, that's a source of, of resentment in some countries. And so, uh, so that ties into what these things are all tied together. And, whether it's how it's going to end up, I, I'm just not going to speculate. Does in, in American politics, does foreign policy ever really matter that much? If there is a shooting war, if people are dying, and increasingly uh, if we're just acting as advisors and only a, only a few people from uh, flyover country are dying, then it doesn't make it into the national media. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, if we're into a serious war, I mean, Viet Vietnam, for example, in 68, uh, the economy is booming. We're producing war materials. I was working in the Trove steel mills in those days. We were working seven days a week and getting overtime. But still, Johnson, Humphrey lost the election, Wallace made hay, and a lot of it was just because there was a war. Lots of young men from those kinds of areas were dying. What about terrorism? Are we, you know, and I realize now I'm, I'm throwing a lot of uh, kind of spitballs here, but is the age of terrorism, you know, obviously it exists, we still talk about it a lot, but the 9-11 the effect, is that fading? Uh, because that seemed, certainly that was one of the ways that George Bush won re-election in 2004. Um, but, you know, now we're, you know, 12, 13 years after that. Um, is terrorism no longer, uh, or that kind of national security question as relevant as it once was? I think not, but there, there are a set of issues like school shootings, terrorist attacks that have this effect that when it happens, there's an immediate surge and then a quick decay. And I think we're, we're, it's amazing what a society can become accustomed to in regard to sort of normal, the occasional shooting, the occasional terrorist attack. 
Um, so, I, but I don't know who's to say what would happen with another gigantic attack where 3,000 people died. Mm. Uh, that might take a, a while to deteriorate. A final question. Uh, let's we're you know some months out from 2018, the midterms. What what is your best guess? You know, we're in an era of unstable majorities right now. The Republicans own the White House and both houses of Congress. What's going to happen in November? Okay, well, just on the basis, I, without looking at any data, right after the election, I would have said the Democrats' char- chances of taking over the House are good because they only need 24 seats. And in recent memory, midterm elections, that's well within the well within the realm of possibility. The Senate's a much steeper um, climb, of course, because they're defending so many seats and so many seats that are in Trump country. And I still think that's a pretty reasonable uh, projection that the Democrats have a good seat, a good chance in the House, uh, not nearly as good a chance in the Senate. Uh, but a whole lot depends on things in the meantime, if there, if there are terrorist attacks, for example. And the economy, it's, it's interesting that typically the things that determine the midterm losses are the president's performance and the economy, which usually run together. The mm-hmm. president is regarded highly or not be, because of the economy. Now, this is an interesting situation where Trump's numbers are pretty bad, but the economy is just perking along. Right. And so again, from a political science standpoint, this is a chance to sort of separate these two factors, right. which is, is sort of nice. Well, we will leave it there. We've been talking with Morris P. Fiorina of Stanford and the Hoover Institution. His most recent book is Unstable Majorities. Morris, thanks so much for talking. You're very welcome. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie. Mm-hmm.